Newman. All right. Um, well, you, Richard, said that you were the outsider of this conference because you were the only American, but I have a feeling I'm the only one here who got a B in high school. It's been that kind of, put up your hand if you did so I know I'm not alone. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Um, this is kind of intimidating, and I feel like Joe, you know. It is a boot, not a bout. Um, I actually had to go to about school uh, at, uh, at American Network Television. This will tell you a lot about where their heads are at, uh, because as I was watching Arthur's work, I was thinking, you know, let's see what show in American Network Television that could play on. Hey, there isn't one, you know. So what are they thinking? What are they thinking about? Well, I had a, a rather unique experience. I've had, I've had some very wonderful experiences at ABC News, and I've, I've had some rather public failures as well. And the very beginning of my time there was a time where they were trying to f figure out just what I was. You know, when you come down from Canada, they, um, you know, they've seen a little bit of your work, but they assume that you're absolutely green, and they've got to test you, and it's like that when you switch countries. Your credit rating doesn't follow you either. My very first credit card in America when I was 36 had a credit rating of $250. <laughs> so I bought the groceries and that was that. Um, anyway, so they sent me to About School. Now, About School is a wonderful woman on the east side of Manhattan that a lot of network correspondents have gone to. Uh, and it's not just Canadians. But they go there to sort of teach them voice coaching if they have a problem with their voices. And, and um, it wasn't so much there was a problem with my voice, it was my Abouts. And like many Canadians, you, you, I, I went to her, I said, I don't hear the difference, all right? There just isn't a difference. And she said, there is a difference. You say about, we say about. <laughs> and I said, all right, fine, you've got to explain this to me. And she finally did, just for your edification, if you ever meet an American and you want to say, what is this all about? We say, about, they say, about. So she had me in her office going, about, about and just doing this about thing, and so whenever I wrote it, I still couldn't get it. Whenever I wrote it, I would, I would write A-B-O-W-T, just to remind me to put my mouth like that. But then, invariably, when I was doing Good Morning America, there was no script, and you can't change that kind of thing, so. So the about school didn't really work. Um, so then, um, you know, they, uh, they sent me to host school. Now, host school is, um, <laughs> Uh, it teaches you some very interesting things. Um, it teaches you to look at yourself as a viewer, which is a very valuable thing, because we all have sort of ticks and things that we hate. I mean, if you hate to hear your voice recorded, imagine what it's like to watch yourself in television. It's 10 times worse, all the little things that you never knew you did that annoyed people. You know, you gotta kinda get rid of that kind of stuff. But they, um, this chair, they taught, me, um, they taught me how to sit on television. And there's a way to sit on television. You don't, first of all, you don't sit like this. Okay, first of all, you don't sit in a swivel chair because everybody in a swivel chair will go like this. Um, and you don't sit like this, you sit like this on the edge of your chair so that you're interested. And if you're a man, you don't put your legs too wide. If you're a woman, you don't put them wide at all. Um, and uh, it's better if your knees, if you, if you ever notice, they have little boxes. They sometimes, it's better if your knees are absolutely perpendicular to the camera because then you look slimmer. And, you know, who really cares? Well it seems that network television cares. And then they sent you to the color consultant. Um, and then, the, so you're at the color consultant and I was never very good at picking my own clothes. Um, so they sent me a woman who was very nice and it turns out I look great in green ties, so I wore a lot of green ties. So that was fine. And then I got the job of Good Morning America, so I seem to have passed all these tests, <laughs> whatever that was. And, and you know, ultimately you sort of decide this is all fun and well, I'll take it for what it's worth. I'll take it as an outsider's view on my performance. Because you don't want to have these little annoyances interrupting your line of communication. You want to make sure that you are communicating as effectively as you can. But then they sent me to, then they showed me an interview and what they thought an interview was. And it was like an orchestra to them. An, or, an interview was, had a three beat. It was like, a, what's the three beat, a waltz? Dun, 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 one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And it turns out that the master of the three beat interview is Matt Lauer, who is my direct competition. And so they made me sit there and watch tapes of Matt, who is, I think, a pretty good interviewer. 
only he had it down to, I mean, they, it's, there's a science to it, which I never realized. I just thought we were trying to get answers and try to find some truth, but there's actually science to it. You hit them hard with the first one, and then you ask a couple of second ones. You hit them super hard with the second one. And then the third one, it's kind of a soft, you know, because it's a morning show and you want to be friendly and you don't want to be upsetting too many people as they head out the door. So I was watching Matt's one, two, three, waltz. waltz. And ultimately, I sat, it, it just screwed my head up. There was just too much information. I was too self-conscious. And I just decided, you know what? This is it. You know, if this is going to work, it's going to be a long-term relationship. And I might as well just hang out there and, you know, not be too, you know, too rough around the edges. But that if I start worrying about this stuff like crazy, it's not going to work. Because it was my fundamental belief that morning television was a relationship, that you could be more casual. And you had to, um, people would get to know you over time. And if you were yourself, you would re be rewarded over time. Well, that was kind of my fallacy. Um, <laughs> I lasted about eight months. And it was about five months into it that uh, I realized that it was over. Because I was called up along with my co-host at the time, Lisa McCree. Uh, and it wasn't going well. You know, it just wasn't gelling well. And uh, there were a lot of other various problems with it. And, and their solution was to say, you know what? You be the football player, you be the cheerleader. That's what we want. And at that moment, I thought, this is never going to work. You know, I work out, I mean, look like a football player, but I don't know what a football player thinks like. I don't know what they meant by that. You know, they just wanted a story that they could recognize. They wanted a relationship that they could recognize that somebody could turn on and say, oh, he's a football player and she's a cheerleader. Lisa's not a cheerleader. Um, and I was not a football player. And at that moment, <laughs> two days previous to that, I had just bought a new house. I got on... I left my boss's office and I called my wife and I said, we've got to get out of this house because I'm toast. They will never understand what it is that, that, that I think I bring to this thing. And it turns out I was right. Um, so that was kind of an interesting introduction um, to uh, a pretty privileged position and it was an intense time and, uh, and I thought maybe this journalism thing had sort of reached its peak. That if, you know, when Arthur Kent can't work at network television, maybe I can't anymore. But luckily, and thankfully, ABC was kind enough to give me some time at Nightline. And uh, Nightline, I had a moment of epiphany. I was sent to um, uh, a um, story in Manhattan, it was a JFK Jr. story, uh, and I was sent to go to Trebek, his Trebek apartment, to be a chair with his wife, and report what I saw. But my editor, who was a very wise man, Tom Batag, and, um, and uh, Ted as well, said, you know, go there and you have to fill eight minutes. And I'm going, eight minutes? I mean, what, they're going to put flowers down? Eight minutes. He said, you go there and you report what you see. I don't want to, don't, don't literally describe it, but report it. And so, okay, fine. So I stood there and I spent the first half hour, because I was lucky enough, just staring at it and trying to figure out what it is I was seeing, because I had spent 15 years sort of building my own expectations of what I was going to see versus what the expectations were the editor wanted to see versus what I thought the audience would need to see. And I just decided to just have this cleansing experience and watch it. And I noticed that women were taking their children and they were just glancing at the cameras before they brought them up to lay the, the flower down. And I, 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 I watched this for a while and I probed it and I asked some questions. Then I stood up and I, did a, I said, I want to do this stand up now because I think I get this. And so I did this stand-up, and it just sort of popped out of my head. And I said, you know, I don't know what's happening here. There are like 300 people and about 150 cameras, and I'm not sure if any of this is real. I'm not sure whether I've changed reality by being here or whether it would have existed if I had not been here. And, um, and that's all I said. And it just came off the top of my head, and the cameraman sort of peeked around and said, what was that? What was that about? And, and <laughs> And I realized uh, at that moment that that was probably, in my 17 years of journalism, the most truthful thing I had ever reported. Um, and from that point on, I got it. Um, I mean, Arthur's been to toiling in truth-telling for a good long while, but I think that what it taught me was that there was a power in real truth that I fear um, network television is... is is losing its, its, its focus on. I think that what's happened to a large degree is, is, is we have become enamored of the manipulation. And we have become um, narcissistic in our own you know, ability to affect people's emotions. 
and if you look at a, uh, at a program on another network, Dateline, uh, and you look at the way that program is programmed, you know, there are, there, are, there are pushes, there are pumps, there are like little moments here and there, and you're never left alone to contemplate, to think. You are entertained entirely. And I suppose it really came into mind when I was listening to Norman this morning, and, and there was just such a powerful truth, truthfulness in everything that he said, in many things that he said. And it just, I don't know about you guys, but it just like, it goes up your spine and you go, oh my God, there's truth, right? And it's like, it exists. Truth just exists. It's a question of whether it finds the mirror. And so here was this, this fiction maker, this movie maker, giving me a lesson in truth. I'm supposed to be the truth teller, and I feel that I've spent a life creating fiction in many ways, or one step removed from fiction. And I, I thought that was a pretty, uh, a pretty interesting moment. I mean, there are still people, I don't want to be too heavy-handed about it, that are, that are struggling to find truth. Um, but it is being packaged network news in both countries. This isn't just in the United States now. It is being packaged, it is being prodded, and, um, and, and they are, are, are taking pleasure occasionally in, uh, in their ability to manipulate. Um, I want to give you an example of two other stories and two different approaches to it. Uh, you may remember the story of the uh, black man that was dragged behind the uh, pickup truck in the, in the southern US. Terrible, ugly crime. And um, there were two ways to report it. The one way was the way that most people reported it, which was it's terrible, horrible thing happened. It has exacerbated racial tensions in this town. It is outraged both blacks and whites. And then there's another way to report it that may have come closer to the truth. Oh, and, and by the way, Jesse Jackson was there, the Reverend Al Sharpton, the people who, who, who you would expect to, to, to seize on the moment and to, um, and to point to this as an example of how racism still exists in America, and by God, it sure does. Um, but the other story that, that, that we tried to tell at Nightline, I thought, was a very different story. Now, I don't know whether it was the truth, but it felt closer to the truth. And that was the story of the uh, black church leader who, who worked like hell in those following days to, to tone the Reverend Jackson down, to tone the Reverend Al Sharpton down, and to not make his community an example for a, a countrywide problem because there, you know, as bad as the media is, and it is bad sometimes, we blow into people's lives, disrupt the whole community, and then leave. There, is also, there are also other people who are invested in the, uh, in the political process who do that as well. So we focused on two people, two community leaders of the church that worked against what you would think would be their own community's interests, to keep things calm, to keep the community together, and it turns out the community weathered it fairly well. So that's an example of, of of truth telling that is, 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 is becoming more and more rare. Um, and I think that, you know, as we've come to love form for its own sake, um, I, I see elements of that here too with the internet. I think, you know, everybody's talking content, content, content. We're in love with content, but we're in love with the idea of content. I don't know of much internet content that we're truly in love with, right? It's just not there yet. We are, we are, we become enamored, and I, and I think this is part of what is driving network television crazy, is we become enamored with information, we become enamored with, um, with the form, we become enamored by all we can do now. We can, you know, put a camera over our eyes and, and shoot pictures, but, but who out there is saying, well, is it good? I don't know. I mean, is it good? I think what's happened is, not only network television, but the, but the information providers that are in the internet and the dot-com world, they've mixed up information with knowledge. And I think what we have happening now is, is a lot of very interesting information being moved in a lot of very interesting ways. But, but do we in fact, are we in fact creating knowledge? When Arthur talks about the knowledge that you need in order to be a civil society, um, I'm not sure network television is creating that knowledge base, and I'm not sure the internet is creating it yet either. You know, we are, the challenge, I think, for everybody is to figure out who does what best. And, and my feeling is, is that the internet will probably only ever, in the flow of, flow of news, be a terrific source of information that the people will look to and will need to look to network television for knowledge. Now, whether network television is ready to accept that, uh, I doubt it, because they still think that they're in the information business and they're still trying to figure out what is it that we do. Um, but I still, but I, I want to get back to the point of, conf of, of the confusion between information and knowledge and what is the difference. And I saw a great quote um, from a valedictorian um, at the University of Connecticut. His name is David uh, McCullough, and he's a history graduate. 
And, and he said that we're being sold the idea that information is learning and we're being sold a bill of goods. Information isn't learning. It isn't common sense. It isn't kindness. Information isn't trustworthiness or good judgment. Information isn't imagination or a sense of humor. It's not courage. It doesn't tell us right from wrong. And I think what he's telling us is that information by itself is pretty valueless and that it has to lead to some sort of knowledge. And whether it's network television or whether it is the internet or any other form of communication, you know, we have to strive to create knowledge um, in our community and we have to strive to spread that knowledge as well. And I worry that what's happened is we have been, in network television anyway, we've been creating little fictions that increasingly the body politic just doesn't believe anymore. Or they can't determine what's, what kind of fiction it is. You know, what's the difference between the way an extra is packaged and the way Dateline NBC is packaged? Not a lot. They're still manipulating people in the same way with music and graphics and everything else. And so it's a wash, which is why when something like Truthful comes on, whether it's a nightline that's truthful or 60 Minutes or the odd documentary that actually makes it on air, it pierces right through because of the power of truth. And if we can, if we can keep our eye on that and, um, and if we can realize that in, a, in an information overloaded society that, that there will be a role for knowledge, then I think there can be a renaissance and that the dinosaur really isn't dead yet. It can, it's on its way, uh, but it's not the nature of the medium that is dying in my view, it is, the, it, it, is the, it is the concept that has occupied the place for so long and, uh, and I hope we're all smart enough to, uh, to be able to change it. Thank you very much. Thank you.